good morning and good evening to everybody uh, let us uh, just say om three times the spine is straight yog mudra then om om <laughs> Oh all are welcome and good evening as well as good morning to everybody now priti ma'am has joined today and we are just discussing chinese completed bhb just to be uh, to be completed today uh, chapter 5th is to be taken today and ayurvedic acupressure uh, chapter 4 has been taken yesterday by Uh, Pradeep Arora ma'am. Now today it will be finished. So it may be the last class, but if time permits, then we can join again for one session only, just to go through the questions as well as multiple choice questions. So uh, welcome to Pradeep ma'am. Uh, she has joined. Priti ma'am, you are welcome. Just give me one minute, sir. Just give me one minute. I'm sharing it. I just share it. Okay. Thank you. Continue. Am I audible? Yeah, audible. Just give me a sec. Good evening, respected sir and friends. Good evening. Okay, so today we will be discussing food and nutrients. And uh, before we move on to the main topic, I just want to recapitulate uh, one point that we need to remember that uh, because I just want to give you a perspective of things because we are going to uh, discuss about protein, fats, and carbohydrates. So, from where are we coming towards protein, fats, and carbohydrates, and why is it important for us? I just want you to recap one point that we must remember, like we had started in the chapter one number one, that a body is composed of sixty percent water and forty percent of soluble substances, which are organic as well as inorganic. So, when we talk about organic elements, we already know that they are made of uh, organs, uh, uh, organic compounds. and they constitute 33% and they consist of proteins fats and carbohydrates and when you talk about the um, inorganic elements that is only 7% and it consists of vitamins minerals uh, you know iron calcium magnesium all the minerals that you see around yourself that is only 7% so our main topic of discussion today is protein fats and carbohydrates so i just wanted to give you a background as to why we are discussing protein fats and carbohydrates in that context okay So now we already know that food and water are both very crucial and at the core of our daily survival, and we can neither live without food nor water. So when we uh, in this context, we must understand that uh, whatever food we eat and the nutrients that we consume from the food, they uh, have basically two concepts that over uh, that uh, you know rule this concept of food and nutrients, and we must understand these two principles in order to understand the food that we eat and also the nutrients that we derive from the food that we eat. Now these two principles are proximate principle of food. and the protective principle of food so when we come to proximate principle of food proximate principle is the uh, is that food which makes the basic components of your food and these includes your proteins 
the fats and the carbohydrates that you consume from the food. And the second is a pr protective principle of food which is very clearly from the name as it has, that it is that food that protects us and gives us immunity to fight diseases. And this includes your vitamins, minerals, water, okay? So this is basically the inorganic compounds that we had discussed a minute earlier. So now we are going to be focusing only on the proximate principle of food, because this is what we need in a daily diet, and this is what keeps us running, our, us running and also our body functions running, you know? So this brings us to the first uh, component of proximate principle of food, which is your protein. So protein is made up of smaller units that have come together to form a complex substance called protein. And this unit is called as amino acids. What I mean to say when I say this statement, I'm trying to say that protein is made up of smaller units, which are called as amino acids. So different types of amino acids come together to form protein, correct? So when you will, uh, if that is if you will break down protein of any type, you will get amino acids. Just like we say the cell is the structural and functional unit of our body, we say that amino acids is this, uh, the functional unit of protein. So we must, uh, at this uh, juncture, we must understand about fats and carbohydrates also, because we will be discussing that as well. So the smallest unit of uh, protein is amino acids, the smallest unit of fat is fatty acids, and the smallest unit of carbohydrates is glucose. So a lot, a lot of fatty acids, they come together to form fat, uh, many glucose, uh, many carbohydrates or glucose compounds come together to form carbohydrates. So if you will break down either fats or carbohydrates, you will be ending up with fatty acids and glucose. So whether that carbohydrate is simple or complex, you will be ending up with glucose only. Then you must come to the functions of the protein. Functions of protein implies why do we need protein in the body? Why is it so necessary? So if you will look in the book, it is written, it is written very beautifully in a book. Like it is essential for the formation of cell in all living beings. Secondly, for children, it is essential for their growth and development. In adults, it is responsible for the repair and the wear and repair of the wear and tear of the body, and also for the formation of new cells. In pregnant ladies, it is needed for the for the nutrition of embryo, and in mothers, it is needed for the formation of breast milk. Also, protein is helping you to form the bones, your muscles, your body fluids, your enzymes, your hormones, your antibodies. All this are made only and only because of protein. And one gram of protein will give you 4.2 kilocalories of energy. That is, if you will eat protein, if you will eat one uh, gram of protein, it will give you 4.2 kilocalories of energy in your body. And your diet must contain one gram of protein for every per kg of your body weight. So, for example, if you weigh 50 kgs, you need 50 grams of protein in your daily diet. And this protein should be 15% of your diet and 50% of this 15% should come from your animal or animal produced uh, animal products. Secondly, we move on to fats. In our body, now fat can be found. First, I'll talk about the how do you find fat in your body. Second, I'll discuss how fat is found in your food that we eat on a daily, daily basis. So, first, I'll discuss about how fat is found in the body. Uh, in a body, fat can be found in two forms. We have structural fats and we have a natural fat. So structural fat, as the name implies, it is that fat that is helping you to build the structure of the cell membranes and the organelles that we found in the cell. If you remember, we had endoplasmic reticulum, we had Golgi apparatus, we had uh, endoplasmic reticulum, we have mitochondria, ribosomes, lysosomes, all this we had discussed in the chapter uh, two that was dealing with cells. But the structural fat will not help you in emergency. It is only to form the structures of their cell membranes. Keep that in mind. Secondly, we come to the natural fat. Now, natural fat is that fat that gives you energy if glucose is not available for the generation of energy. That is, if you if you are low on, uh, supposing you have eaten such a diet that you don't have protein uh, sources in your body, your liver cannot break down, break down that glucose in order to give you that energy. So in the presence of that glycogen that you have in the liver, what will give you energy in the body? It is this natural fat that is found in the, you know, in the storehouses in the body, where it is stored in the body. This is going to give you energy in those emergency situations where you don't have the sources of uh, glycogen uh, that is found in liver. So this is stored in different storage areas in the body. The storehouses of fat here, uh, natural fat are subcutaneous tissue, which gives you 50, that stores 50% of the fat. Second, you have the perirenal tissue, that gives you 15% of fat. Third is the mesentery, that is 10% of fat. Omentum, which stores 5% of the fat. And then you have the intramuscular connective tissue that gives you the 5% of fat. 
Now let's discuss them in detail so that you understand the meanings of all of them. Now subcutaneous uh, fat is stored under our skin. Under our skin, we have a spongy layer under the skin, which have on uh, you know where many gaps are present in that skin layer, and that is basically called as the areolar tissue. So this areolar tissue is present there, which is very thin and it has very sparse collagen fibers that lets fat and air deposit there very easily. So 50% of your fat is stored under the skin, and it is this subcutaneous fat that is used for the first uh, used in the first case when the body needs it. This is the first line of emergency. Second is your perirenal fat. Now renal means kidney and peri means around that kidney. So perirenal fat is a fat that is stored around your kidneys and it also gives you energy when you need them. So 15% of fat is stored around your kidneys. That is broken down when it, the body needs it. Third is your mesentery. Now mesentery and omentum are very interconnected to each other. Mesentery is a fan-shaped continuous connective tissue that in your abdomen that attaches the intestines to your abdominal wall. If mesentery was not there, your intestines will slosh around in your abdomen. If you move a bit, if you fall down, your intestines will be sloshing around in your intestines. And they're held in their place only because of this mesentery that we have. Okay. So this also transport your lymph and blood to your gut. That is your intestines. Now 10% of your fat is stored here. Then you come to omentum. Now this omentum is also fat, but it is thinner than the mesentery. It is very lacy in appearance. It is a large fat adipose tissue layer that is, you know, surrounding your stomach and all the other organs that you have in your abdomen. It stores fat that serves, uh, you know, it stores fat that uh, keeps these organs warm. And technically, we have only 5% of fat here. But when we stretch it to its limit, we eat very, uh, you know, eat very much or we exercise very less. We have a sedentary lifestyle. Then we end up with a protruding belly. So whenever you have a protruding belly or a pot belly, it is only with this fat that is surrounding your omentum. So all the belly fat is all thanks to your momentum. Um, after that, we have the fat that we have. Uh, also, we have intramuscular connective tissue. Now, this refers to the fat that is deposited inside the muscles. Intra means in inside and muscular, also, obviously, as the name implies, it is muscle fat. So then we have the fat in food. This was about the fat in your uh, body. And then we come to the fat in food. The fat present in food is classified into two groups, the visible fat and the invisible fat. Now, this is very clearly from the name as you have it. Visible fat, as the name implies, can be easily seen and identified by you. For example, that the fat that you have in butter, in ghee, in your groundnut, mustard, sesame. Okay. And this is the visible fat. Now, this visible fat is also uh, of two types, saturated fat and unsaturated fat. Now, saturated fat is that fat which is solid at room temperature. Like you have butter and you ghee, which is at solid at room temperature. And then the unsaturated fat is that fat which is liquid at room temperature. Your vegetable oils, like mustard oil, sesame oil, groundnut oil, all these are unsaturated fats. Uh, so between saturated and unsaturated fat, unsaturated fat is good because it is liquid at room temperature. So it will improve your blood cholesterol levels. It will ease the inflammation in your body. It will reduce your risk of cardiovascular diseases and it will improve your overall health. But there has to be a healthy balance between your saturated and unsaturated fat. It is not that you should consume only unsaturated fat. You have to balance it along with your uh, butter and ghee as well. Then you have the invisible fats. Now, invisible fats, as the name implies, is seen. It can be it can be seen, but it is present in the food in varying amounts, such as the fat content in your milk, the nuts, the meat, pulses, all of these things. And then um, very closely related to fat is oils. Oil is also a part of your proximate principle of food. Natural fat gives you three types of fatty acids. It contains three types of fatty acids. You have palmitic acid, stearic acid, and oleic acid. Now, palmitic acid and stearic acid, they are saturated fats. So, they will be solid at room temperature. But oleic acid is one with an unsaturated fat, and it is liquid at room temperature. And this is the reason why it is called as oil. Then we come to the functions of fat. Functions of fat, again, as the name implies, we are trying to understand why fat, why fat is important. So first of all, the most important function of fat is that it is the storehouse of your energy. Whatever energy you get from the food that you eat is only and only because of fat. Some amount of fat is obviously needed to get energy and skinny people will not be getting this energy as they are less in fat. They will even feel more cold also. They will not be able to do long duration of work. They will not be able to walk too long, uh, too much, you know. They can't do any heavy work. So this is all because they lack fat in their body. Then fat also gives you food uh, palatability. 
palatability is that uh, you know taste that you get from the food that you eat it makes the food tasty and then it also reduces the time of gastric emptying now gastric emptying is the time that is uh, is refers to the time that takes from the stomach the food to move from your stomach to your duodenum and so on into your small intestine and then it continues its journey in the large intestine and then it is moved out to your body gradually so the when you have fat in your food this reduces the type of the the time of the gastric emptying now supposing fat was not there then this food will be you know very will be very sluggish in your stomach it will not be able to move very smoothly you have peristaltic movements in your stomach if you have read that in your uh, this book same book we have peristaltic movements in the stomach so if fat is not there these peristaltic movements will not be able to do you know they will not be able to have a nice momentum in them they will not be very smooth the food will be you know sluggish in the stomach it will be, it will uh, start carrying there will st start forming a lump over there and that is also very bad health condition first the food starts rotting then it starts giving you acidity and it gives a lot of problems you know you have stomach pains a huge uh, very severe stomach pain start happening in your stomach so this is only because of fat that the food is able to move smoothly from your stomach to small intestine to large intestine and then it is finally it's spelled out in the form of waste products from your body then the next is uh, that the presence of fat is necessary in food for the absorption of fat soluble vitamins that is the third point that we have here so there are two types of vitamins you have the fat soluble vitamins and you have water soluble vitamins fat soluble vitamins are those vitamins which are soluble in fat and water soluble vitamins are those vitamins which are soluble in water the examples of fat soluble vitamins are vitamin a vitamin b vitamin e vitamin k and the water soluble vitamins are vitamin c and vitamin d so fat makes this the fat vitamins soluble and it balances them in these fat soluble vitamins into your body like the vitamin b a e k so fat is made trying to make them balanced in your body then the fourth point we have here is essential fatty acids are necessary for the growth of body so essential fatty acids are those acids which are not synthesized in body we get them from outside okay so but they are necessary for the growth of the body since they make hormones that regulate the immune system and your central nervous system these include your linoleic acid your linolenic acid and the arachidonic acid these are all the essential fatty acids then fats also provide insulation to the body so you must have observed that if you're slim or skinny you will feel more cold in comparison to somebody who is fat or obese as they will have more you know they will feel more hot anybody who is fat will feel very hot because they have lots of fat so fat is controlling your body temperature also in this sense the fats must not be more than 35% in your diet okay protein is 15% and fat should be 35% now next we come to the carbohydrates which is the major which is the major chunk of your diet and it should be the major chunk of your diet it will be it should be 50% of your diet so carbohydrates are they form the major part of your food and ideally your consumption of carbohydrates should be 50% or more as we get our energy from carbohydrates because it is these carbohydrates that are broken down into glycogen and they are stored in liver in plants the carbohydrates are present in the form of starch and cellulose but since as human uh, humans we can't digest starch and cellulose directly so we we get them from plant products like we have you know patua uh, methi all this spinach whatever we eat this is all you know because of that that we are able to digest this plant proteins and plant uh, uh, plant fat so in a body it is formed it is formed in the it is found in the form of glycogen the smallest amount of carbohydrate is glucose and if you that is if you will break down carbohydrates whether they be simple carbohydrates or complex carbohydrates you will get glucose and extra glucose is deposited in a body in the in the liver in the form of glycogen so besides liver glycogen is also stored in our bone muscle the percentages are mentioned in the book if you will see those you yeah, like you have bone muscles where it is majorly stored in 400 grams then you have liver 100 grams is stored there then ecf that is your extra cellular fluid which is uh, 20 grams then it is also stored in blood which is only minuscule very small quantity 4 grams but never that it is found there so glucose not only gives you maximum energy but it is also found uh, it is also the food for our nerves our nerves also survive on this now that we have studied about the proteins fats and carbohydrates we must understand uh, two more things as to where from where are we can get these proteins fats and carbohydrates what is the diet that we should be following for that that is also a very contextual question here so the sources of protein are your lentils your green peas your soya bean the veggies fruits nuts oats chicken eggs all these are the sources of your protein 
then the fat comes from your butter ghee the full fat milk that you have baked goods and such as biscuits and pastries your egg yolk salmon fish okay then the carbohydrates you have cereals like wheat rice veggies like potato beetroot apples bananas milk yogurt cheese and shellfish so now logical question that comes to our mind is that obviously we're eating this protein fats and uh, carbohydrates but where is it going in the body where is this body storing this protein fats and carbohydrates in the body that is also we must know that just so that we know our topic very clearly now if you remember the chapter on homeostasis we had uh, read that the atoms of carbohydrates proteins and fats they are present in the internal and external environment of the cell of the cellular fluid but they are not ionic that is they don't carry a charge so they are not hyperactive and the cells are not going to absorb these organic elements more than required from the blood flow the body is not going to store them just like that so when they are not needed by the body they are stored in their own storehouses body has different areas to store them so the protein is stored in the form of extra so extra protein is going to be used either as energy or it is going to be turned into fat and it is stored in your fat cells correct now fat we have already seen where it is stored in the body we have seen about mesentery omentum subcutaneous tissue intramuscular connective tissue fat is found there in the body then carbohydrates we have just read right now that is stored in liver and bone muscles your extra cellular fluid so this is where it is found in the body now very uh, related to this uh, protein fats and carbohydrates we also have two other concepts of cholesterol and triglycerides so cholesterol is a fatty fat like substance that is found in all the cells of your body and a body needs some cholesterol to make hormones and vitamins also especially vitamin d it is also essential part of body just like fat and our cells synthesize it from fat and carbohydrates so simply put fat plus carbohydrate gives you cholesterol this cholesterol is present in every cell partially in your cell membrane but maximum it is found in your liver your adrenal cortex and in your sex glands so majority of it is found in the reticulo endothelial cells because this is the place where your uh, destruction of uh, erythrocytes and lymphocytes is taking place erythrocytes was the uh, red blood cells that we had talked about in the previous chapters cholesterol is not that bad it becomes bad only when it is found in excess in your body free cholesterol in your blood should be 150 to 240 micrograms percentage in the blood now excess quantity of cholesterol becomes a threat to your health because the catabolism of cholesterol is very low catabolism means that the when it takes a lot of time and effort by the body to break down this cholesterol into simpler molecules that can be expelled in the expelled from the body or it can be used by the body the body stores out cholesterol in the form of urine or in the bile juice but that is done in very low quantity and high cholesterol raises the risk of cardiovascular diseases since it is mixed with fatty acids and forms a vast like substance which covers the wall of your arteries so this when when this vast gets deposited on your arteries it will create blockages now why do these blockages happen and how do these blockages happen these happen on the wall of the arteries now the width of the arteries is known as lumen so when the fats is uh, depositing on the diameter of these arteries that lumen is decreasing so when the lumen decreases the quantity of blood that is going inside those arteries and veins is also decreasing <clears throat> because of this vats that is there so when this lumen becomes smaller and smaller and smaller the arteries also become harder because of the because of the fact they are not able to have a proper supply of blood the arteries lumen will become small and they will also become hard and because of these two factors it is also known as atherosclerosis this disease is known as atherosclerosis so this that happen at any age and this is happening even in younger people also because we lead a very sedentary and unhealthy lifestyle and we also follow very a very bad diet these days which is not really healthy and you know in in con, in con, concordance with your nature okay. then there are two diseases which are associated with the cholesterol one is infarction it is i n f a r c t i o n it is spelled as infarction and the second one is thrombosis and both of them very much related to each other now in fact it means that the tissue starts dying due to the fact that there is no blood supply in that tissue and this happens because of a blood clot or because of the narrowing of the arteries that happens due to cholesterol and thrombosis is when there's you know you have thrombus you have uh, blood clots forming inside 
any of your blood vessels and this blood clot can settle anywhere in your body if it is settles in your brain it becomes a you know a, a brain thrombosis if it settles in your feet it has a feet thrombosis you have leg thrombosis so this is basically you know blood clots are settling down there it is there, it is uh, inhibiting the flow of simple uh, regular flow of blood to your uh, you know vessels and veins and your heart so this is leading to a infection type of situation Now, then you come to the functions of cholesterol. Yeah. I'm a little fast for you. Please tell me. Is my face okay with you? Any question from anybody? No, sir. Okay. Okay. So we do the functions of cholesterol. So why is cholesterol important? In spite of the fact that it is a uh, it is termed as bad nowadays because we are having many cardiovascular diseases. Now, cholesterol is not the victim. I mean, it is not the culprit in that situation. We are the ones. We are making it bad because of the sedentary lifestyle and because of the bad diet that we have. We don't exercise enough. So why is it important? It is helping in the cell membrane formation. Cholesterol helps to form the structure. You Just like fat was also forming structures, so cholesterol is also forming the structure in your cell membranes. Then there, it is helping in the synthesis of bile salt. Now, in liver, we know that bile is produced and it is stored in the gallbladder and then it goes to the small intestines to be disposed of from the body. So, there is a component of bile which is known as bile salt. So, this bile salt is formed of cholesterol and we can say that cholesterol has a big hand in the formation of bile. Secondly, cholesterol also helps in the form of, uh, helps in the formation of sex hormones, also in the formation of adrenal cortical hormones. Now, the outer part of adrenal gland is called adrenal cortex. And these hormones are produced in this part, which is produced by cholesterol. This is the adrenal cortical hormones, which are produced with the help of cholesterol itself. And lastly, cholesterol provides viscosity to your blood. Viscosity is stickiness to your blood. Then the disadvantage of cholesterol, we have already discussed that it forms a vat like substance. When it mixes with the, when it is synthesized with fat, fat, it forms a vat like substance. So cholesterol plus fatty acids gives you a vat like substance. And it is this substance that will create blockages wherever it gets deposited. If it covers the arteries, it will block your arteries. It will make your arteries hard. And it will make you, give you the arthrosclerosis type of situation. Okay. So elasticity of your vessels will also decrease. And the chances of the blood vessels rupturing also become, uh, becomes very high. Hemorrhage happens, you know, it is only because of cholesterol and because of the fact that the blood supply is very less in your arteries. It also covers, uh, covers your arteries. So it gives you infection type of situation, thrombosis type of situ situation that we have already discussed. Then there are two types of cholesterol. One is LDL and one is HDL. LDL is low density lipoprotein and HDL is high density lipoprotein. We call HDL as a good cholesterol because it is acting as a carrier. And LDL is depositing inside your body. So that is the reason why it is called as a bad cholesterol. And we can also call them active cholesterol, which is your HDL uh, high density lipoprotein, HDL cholesterol. And the passive one is LDL cholesterol because it is depositing. It is not moving freely. It is going to set down where it is, where, where it will find a space where it, the, you have this arthrosclerosis type situation. It will start depositing there and it will worsen the situation. Then you come to the concept of triglycerides. Triglycerides is also a type of fat that is found in blood. Fat, the other name of fat is also lipid. So it is also a type of lipid that is found in blood because this word lipid is mentioned in the book. So I'm using that word here so that you know the context of that. So there is a direct relationship between calories and uh, triglycerides. So you have, eat, if you say, eat a lot of fat, and that fat will produce lots of calories. So these extra calories which have been produced, if they're not used up by your body, you're not exercising to burn those calories. So these calories will get stored in the body, in your body fat cells, in the form of triglycerides. They convert themselves to fatty acids and they will get deposited in the form of triglycerides. So whatever extra energy is produced in the body, it is getting stored in fat cells. And if needed, then the hormones will release these triglycerides. But this is a very painful procedure. This does not happen very easily. So, for example, if you uh, get any blood, uh, blood work done and if you see that like, triglycerides is high, 
so that means that you are having a very sedentary lifestyle and many of them i mean many people i have seen today are having very high intensity of uh, triglycerides because we are not working out that much we have sedentary lifestyles we have sitting at the job uh, sitting at the desks doing a job all day so that is making our level fatty and that is also raising the intensity of uh, the content of these triglycerides in the blood stream so there is a direct relationship between calories and triglycerides more calories means more triglycerides so you must try and try and exercise you know keep a healthy life um, count the calories that you are eating and then also have a healthy balance of exercise it exercise does not mean that you have to go to gym and then you have to you know do the treadmill you can easily sit at home and do pranayam also that is also going to burn your calories so long as you are doing it doing something for the system that is going to burn these calories otherwise they will gas start depositing in your liver in your blood in the form of cholesterol and you will see all the volume shooting up in your blood blood work whatever you get it done now you must understand the difference between triglycerides and cholesterol cholesterol is used in the structural formation and triglycerides are stored in the body to fulfill your food future energy needs different hormones will release these triglycerides whenever body needs them but the body will reach for them only if protein is not there if protein is not there it will, it will go for subcutaneous tissue it will go for intramuscular connective tissue all those fats that we have seen it first will go for that and this is the last thing that it will come to so you really i would try this to stress on this point that you should try and exercise then we come to after we discuss this we come to the concept of uh, energy and related to that is the concept of your calories energy as we have in the book energy is the strength or the ability to do work okay so there is the uh, just one thing i had to tell you about uh, this if you will see this equation there glucose co2 plus h2o plus minus 7 calories point heat i just want to explain that a little bit so that you understand what you are reading in the book so when you uh, food is now we knew that food is needed to obtain energy and not simply to derive taste so we uh, whenever you get energy from the food we are getting energy from two sources from water uh, sorry from the from the air and from the food correct we get glucose from the food that we eat plus the oxygen that we get from the air at the time of respiration now this glucose is burned by this oxygen and we get carbon dioxide plus water and some energy is also produced in this process now this energy is obtained from the food and also from the oxygen which i just told you so if you take a cell what happens in the cell now we have eaten food you have released glucose uh, glucose in the body you have taken uh, oxygen from the food uh, from the air and that oxygen has come into your body now what is happening at the cellular level at the cellular level this glucose from the food that you have eaten and the glucose has traveled uh, from the blood to reach your cell now the cell has got glucose and you are also continuously breathing when while the glucose is reaching your cells now the cell is going to absorb this oxygen from the air that you have breathed in and this oxygen res respiration goes to cell and now every cell has got two things in it glucose and oxygen now oxygen helps to burn things that is the only and only work of oxygen so this oxygen is going to burn this glucose and the burning of glucose is going to give you energy and it is this energy that is used by your body now at the time of this energy uh, also some carbon dioxide is also released which we are exhaling out as and when we breathe so this is a continuous process that is going on in your cells so each cell produces this carbon dioxide and through blood it reaches your lungs and from lungs it is exhaled out in the form of carbon dioxide along with some water vapor also goes out now this water vapor is formed by the burning of glucose and the energy is used up by the body to perform different functions of the body respiration exhalation your heart beats everything all that energy that you need it is happening at the cellular level basically at your mitochondria all this is happening in your mitochondria that you studied in the cell chapter now this energy is measured in in calories calorie is a unit of energy we already know that it is not a new concept only now today we are going to learn the basic definition of uh, scientific definition of calorie now in the book it is this is a very beautiful definition and this is the most apt way to describe calories calorie is the unit of energy it is the, it is a unit of energy and it is that quantity of heat which is necessary to raise the temperature of 1 gram of water from 15 degree celsius to 16 degree celsius this is the best way to put calories it is a little daunting to understand at first but if you will get down with it and you will see some doodle also you search online you will be able to get a hang of it but for the moment we'll just stick with this definition of calories now we have uh, studied protein fats and carbohydrates now we must understand how much calories are we getting every time we are eating food 
whatever food we eat when we take that food inside when the moment we ingest that food proteins fats carbohydrates starch everything is going to be separated in your mouth itself this is the first place where the digestion of food is happening that is the first place okay so everything is separated there it gets separated in the uh, when it moves the food moves ahead in your food pipe it moves your it reaches your stomach then the small intestine the large intestine at every level this food is being separated but the moment the first bite that you take and in that first bite itself the body is going to separate proteins fats and carbohydrates correct so 1 gram of starch that is carbohydrate it will give you 4.1 kilocalories of energy 1 gram of protein will give you 4.2 kilocalories of energy and 1 gram of fat will give you 9.3 kilocalories of energy now in the book i believe it is written 1 gram of protein is given you 5.3 kilocalories but i think it is a misprint but you should confirm with your coordinator also because in the same book they have written that uh, calorie protein is given you 4.2 kilocalories so i'm just pointing this out to you because i believe that 4.2 kilocalories is the best way to describe the uh, amount of kilocalories obtained from protein but yet you must coordinate uh, you know uh, confirm it from your coordinator also now everything that we eat has calories and every food that we eat will give you energy the energy requirement is not uniform there is no set formula and it is also depending on the type of work that you are doing so in the book we also find that uh, if you will see the book on the last last but one page you will see the protein should be 1 gram per kg of your body weight and 50% of it should come from the animal products and the whole diet must contain 15 grams of protein and we have already talked about the vegetable sources of protein also then the carbohydrate must be 50% or more than it now we need more carbohydrates because they are this is the one the thing that is giving you energy in the body and it should contain 10 to 15% of food belongs to the cellulose group that is the plant based protein plant based carbohydrate now fat must not be more than 35% and animal products should be less as less as possible diet must contain essential amount of vitamins minerals and water also this is all mentioned in the book now water is also needed obviously we know that we a body is composed of 60% of water and we need water also to maintain the fluidity of all the fluids that we have in body you have your cerebrospinal fluid you have your sweat your urine all these are fluids in the body your ear vats everything is fluid in the body we don't have any liquid in body we have only fluids in body um now what is also they have put what into three groups in order to make you understand the concept of energy how much energy is needed by every person so you can always see the sedentary workers are those people like teachers tailors who are basically doing a, a sitting job they are just sitting at a desk and they are doing their job then you have the moderate workers the people who are making baskets you have carpenter mechanic farmers plumbers all these are moderate workers then you have the heavy workers like you have the laborers the person who breaks stones the blacksmith the person who is cutting your trees the laborers who are working in mines so these are all heavy workers and the energy requirements and the calorie requirements of each labor would be different every person would be different so 24 kilocalories gives you one unit of uh, energy and then they have categorized between the man and woman also that is what is the energy requirement of a man and a woman now nowadays women are as active as men but then since the time we had the subject it was written from long back so it was basically classified that men needed more energy and women needed a comparatively less amount of energy but i guess that's not the way we should be looking at it because i think women are as active as men if not more then there are the energy requirements and the calorie requirements they also are very different in age groups so you will see all the age groups we have seen that energy requirements are increasing from 1 to 3 years when you need only 0.4 units of energy to 12 21 years and above when we need only one unit of energy so these are uh, the energy requirements you obviously keep on increasing with age with gender and obviously with diseases also if you are not healthy then then also you will need more calories because the body is going to need continuous supply of food continuous supply of energy then you also have a there is talking about the diseases that you have now the quality um if you will see this hemasmus is mentioned here when you have a low calorie diet you uh, will suffer from malnutrition um wait 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 
Cross shoulder is a diet which is low protein diet, and marasmus disease will afflict you if you have a low calorie diet. And obviously, if you overeat, you will be obese. That is another form of disease that we see nowadays. That's with this topic. Any, I'm open to questions now. Please, if any has any, have anybody has any doubts? Kindly come forward, please.